Okay, thank you, Allison. Um, welcome, everyone. So just to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me, I'm Joan Greer, and I'm a professor in the history of art, design, and visual culture in the Department of Art and Design, and an affiliate of the Sustainability Council. I'm truly delighted today to be working together with the Council to bring you this talk by Tang Li, which is entitled Synergy and Creativity in a Pandemic World Thing. Tang Li is Professor Emeritus. After 41 years teaching in architecture, engineering, and environmental health at the University of Calgary. He has also taught in other Canadian universities, as well as in the USA, Europe, and Asia. Tang Li serves on many national and international committees and has served as an expert witness in over 80 civil and criminal cases pertaining to building, building failures and indoor air quality problems. On a more personal note, Tang Li is also a close colleague and a friend. He has for many years contributed regularly and generously to my history, of, uh, history and theory of sustainable design course. And indeed, uh, thinking back on this, I've been thinking about it over the last few days, and, and many students have conveyed to me that Tang Lee's talks and visits to our classroom over the years have been inspirational, sometimes even life-changing in their own journeys towards finding creative and responsible, sustainable solutions. It is then my honor to present Tang Lee. Tang, over to you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Yes, Thank yes. you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I'd like to thank Joan and the Sustainability Council for the invitation to share some of my thoughts about this uh, sustainability. Um, as we go through this pandemic, it's obviously in everybody's mind um, at the moment. Um, and I have some thoughts that I'd like to share with you because everything that we do is really about the future. And so I've got some slides here that I'd like to, um, to, to, to talk with you about. Um, and the title that I have decided for this particular presentation is Synergy and Creativity. And I'll be defining that a little bit later. But I've added the term in a pandemic world because that's what uh, uppermost in everybody's mind right at the moment. And so what we do today is really for the future, regardless of what it is that we're planning to do, whether we're designing a building or designing a project or even planning a trip to the grocery store. It's not for the moment right now, it is for the future. The future could be several minutes from now, it could be a week, it could be a year. And so the thing is, how can we know about the future? How can we predict the future? And so, obviously, we a crystal ball or a fortune teller is not very reliable. Neither are some self-proclaimed prophets. But you know what? We can examine trends. We know the present, okay? And we do know what's happening in the past if you look at history. And from those trends, you could project, extrapolate into the future. The trends are not precise, but fairly accurate if you look at high, medium, and low scenarios for these trends. So the trends also take into account our finite resources and knowing our rate of consumption. So let's look at some trends and where it would take us into the future. So here we have um, today, um, in uh, 2021, our life expectancy has increased with the corresponding increase in population. Uh, world um, oil production has increased due to demands for energy to power our society. And there's increasing industrial output. So it seems really, really good. Unfortunately, natural resources are trending downwards, such as depletion of the rainforest, seafood, and pollution is also increasing. As I said, we know the present, we know the past, let's look at the trends for the next 80 years. And so 
but perhaps 80 years is way too long. How about 40 years? Or maybe how about in 20 years? Is there, um, can we envision what 20 years would be like? So it's interesting that life expectancy is peaking and will decrease over time. And the question is why? Because life expectancy has increased due to advances in medicine and technology, but there are things that are starting to impact our life expectancy. And that could be obesity due to our diet, it could be pollution, it could be disease, it could be climate change. We know that 9 million people died due to air pollution, air and water pollution, 25,000 deaths due to COVID in Canada. And of course, the United States, our neighbor had about 600,000 deaths due to COVID. And globally, there's about three and a half million who has died and probably much higher if we can account for them all. Well, oil production is peaking and it's on a downward trend because there's only so much fossil fuel that are in the world. Okay, so I'm, fossil fuel is finite. Uh, there's only so much in the world that we have today. These are trends that the oil company has um, predicted based on their uh, ability to extract more and more from the finite resources we have on the planet. Um, nuclear energy is also finite because there's only so much uranium in the world. Um, so let's look at what happens um, if we look at, say, in 50 years. If we look at the 50-year line, that is probably about midlife for a project. If we design a building, we expect that the building would be 100 years and midlife would be about 50 years. So the question is, uh, what is the world like in 50 years, midlife when the, when the building or project is halfway through its lifespan? What will power these buildings when they all reach middle age? Will the rising sea levels drown them? Will it be viable when it reaches middle age? So it's interesting that you look at any of these scenarios of of uh, energy, that the only future that we really have, a viable future, is renewable. So that's something that I wanted to share with you uh, today. Um, so here we have this beautiful graph that I drew up of a long time ago, about 200 million years ago, and to the year 4000. In the middle there, the little blip that I uh, have uh, shown there, represents all the fossil fuel we have with on the planet Earth. So I've just said that. And we haven't started using that fossil fuel until about the Industrial Revolution, when we started to extract that fossil fuel and start to use it. It's interesting that we, that our grandparents did not have fossil fuel to use. And now we have to think about that this generation will not have fossil fuel to use. So. If you look at society and civilization in the long term, we only have about 250 years of fossil fuel. So we really just live in a fossil fuel age, which means that we were actually very fortunate to be born in this period of civilization. If we were born with our, during our grandparents' time, we wouldn't have fossil fuel to use. We'll be using animal power or whatever. And in the future, your children, or maybe even the students in this generation, is going to be facing a future in which there would be no fossil fuel to use. It's all going to be gone because that little blip represents all the fossil fuel that we have. So we know that Dubai has an unimaginable wealth from fossil fuel. Well, they were saying that my father rode a camel, just like our grandparents, and that I drive a Mercedes Benz, okay, the current people that are in Dubai right now. And it's okay, the sun will probably drive a Land Rover. However, after the sun, the grandchildren, the sun will ride a camel again because all that fossil fuel in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia, and the Middle East will have been consumed. So, what would happen to Dubai? when it runs out of fossil fuel. So that's a question that we need to think about. And so we run out of fossil fuel, are we going to have to go back 
to animal power. And that's something that we might want to consider. So we have used in the past energy from nature. The trade winds that goes across the Atlantic Ocean uh, can carry ships you know, between Europe and North America. Well, there's some work that is being done and it's very encouraging that some of the ships are starting to put sails on their ships. And just by doing that, it can reduce the amount of consumption of fossil fuel to move those ships somewhere by 50 to 80 percent. But of course, you need to know when the wind, where the wind is blowing and you would, of course, uh, understand where the trade winds are to take advantage of that. But that energy is available and we just need to tap into it and not just rely on fossil fuel to power our ships across the ocean. So we're talking about working with nature, and that's part of the theme that I wanted to share with you today. So the thing is that we don't have disparity between the rich and the poor, and the disparity is growing. This is not a Photoshop picture. It is an actual picture in Brazil and between the poor on the left and the rich people on the right. And that's just a fence. It's a real fence that separates the two uh, disparate um, uh, people in that society. The thing is that that fence may keep out some people and cars from coming over from one to the other, but there are things that it cannot keep out. You know, the wind patterns are gonna carry things from one side to the other side, regardless of whether it's gonna be smoke, pollution, diseases, and so on. And so we really have to think about things particularly now when we're talking about the pandemic, is that the pandemic does not respect uh, property line. It certainly does not respect political boundaries that we have in our society. So I'd like to share with you this global image of, of migrations of air pollution that crosses the globe. We can find that in, uh, in Africa, that any type of pollution and dust storms will migrate eventually to the United States. We also know that any pollution from Asia goes across because of the trade of the winds that goes across and coming, comes down to North America in Canada. This is an actual NASA simulation of air pollution from Asia going across the Pacific Ocean through Alaska, passing through Alaska, and migrating down into Canada, and they've actually detected the air pollution from Asia in Toronto and in the Maritimes. So with this global spread that we cannot prevent uh, spreads of pollution or diseases between countries, uh, let's look at what happens on a weekly basis within two months the uh, COVID-19 has spread all over the world, just in two months. It's a very, very fast. Now that's attributed to um, winds that blows across, but also because of transportation, that we can now go anywhere in the world and we carry with us what we, we take with us from one country to the other country. We're all interconnected on this planet Earth. There's no way if, if so buts about that. So the disparity between the rich and the poor, when we look at things like the pandemic, um, and the World Health Organization said, people should expect to see more coronavirus mutations. I think we're gonna see more variants coming along. And we're gonna have to be very clever in understanding quickly what these variants mean. So you're not going to really protect yourself if you do not look at it globally. The only way to stop disease from affecting the rich is to help the poor. It requires a coordinated international strategy and effort to be able to do that. And we need to think about it, particularly now when we know that it's rising in India, we should be going over there to help those people because whatever happens to them will also happen to us. World population is growing, um, hopefully, 
to a certain extent, but the amount of uh, food production has not increased the same. With depletion of resources, we're going to find that people are going to be feeling very insecure. Riots have been fought over food, fuel, and other resources due to shortage of goods. And we see that all over the world, that if there's not enough. It's a really interesting ethical question because if your child is dying because, or starving because of not enough food, would you go and steal it from another person to save your child? It's a, it's a question that I cannot answer, but it might be the pro, it will be the problem if there's not enough resources for everybody. So what we have done with the oceans is that we have scooped up a lot of the fisheries and it's de depleted with overfishing and pollution. And here we have, of course, the global loss of seafood species. And here we are, 2021, and it's going to be less and less. So in addition, we have been pouring so much pollution into the ocean, everything from heavy metals and, and, and diseases and, 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 and so on, plastics, that it is depleting the supply of seafood. Things like mercury and cadmium and lead are very are neurotoxins. So one of the things that I try to do, even though I'm teaching at the university, is that with the depletion of fish in the ocean, and maybe it's also because I like to eat fish, <laughs> that I started to uh, set up and, and build a fish farm. So because we know that the oceans does not have that much fish, so why not become a fish farmer? So I became a fish farmer from 1996 to 2015. And some buddies of mine and I, we built this just a little bit east of Calgary. And we raised about half a million fish a year for food. So what we raise is tilapia. It's a tropical fish. And yes, it is a foreign species in Canada, and we were concerned about that. But the interesting thing is after we did our environmental impact assessment, we find out that tilapia is a warm water fish that would not survive in Canada. So if any of our fish escapes <laughs> into the Bow River or Saskatchewan River, it's not going to take over and reproduce. But what we've done, of course, as a fish farmer, is that every time you have livestock, there are going to be mortality. And so maybe about 30% mortality, we would uh, round that up. We ask safe ways to bring in their uh, vegetables that they're throwing away. We compost it, and we have beautiful compost that we donated to the community. We also decided that the fish, when it, 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 it becomes murky and dirty because it doesn't eat all the fish food, but also it has fecal matter. And those are actually nutrients. So what we did was that we said, well, is there any way that we could naturally absorb the nutrients from the dirty water from the fish pond? And of course, greenhouses is the way to go. So we decided that we're going to actually be greenhouse growers as well too. So we built a large greenhouse we start to grow the, the, the uh, all kinds of vegetables. We even grow snails or escargot, if you want to call it that, and have all kinds of uh, uh, byproducts that is actually more food for our society. One time, the Calgary Zoo called us up and saying, the hippopotamus pond is getting really murky because the hippos, they eat and they poop into their pool and it's so murky that people can't see it. They asked us whether we could um, give them you know, a couple thousand, actually 10,000 10, fingerlings of our tilapia. So we brought in about 10,000 of our tilapia and put them into the hippopotamus pond in the Calgary Zoo. Within about a month, the uh, pool is clean because our fish eat the fecal matter of the hippopotamus. And it was interesting, after about six months, they call us up and say, you know, the fish is getting too big. Can you take away the fully grown fish and give us the fingerlings again? 
And so that's exactly why we did. So every six months, we bring in the fingerlings, they feed our fish for us to fully grown size. We harvest them, 10,000 of them, and sell them. And it was a win-win situation. This is what we call a synergy. And we continue to do that for many, many years. So what I'm encouraging the people that are listening to this uh, presentation is to look for opportunities where the waste of one becomes a resource for the other. If you can put them together, you can have a synergy that would benefit both parties. And so we were looking at opportunities to raise our tropical fish that needs warm water. So rather than burning natural gas to heat our pools, we said, is there any waste water that is available? And so we went up to Lake Walbaman, which is the northwest of, um, of Edmonton, and there are several coal generated electric plants. And they have a lot of hot water because the coal that they use to generate the electricity makes the turbines too hot. And so they have to pour cooling water over the, uh, the, the generators and they have to, of course, uh, dump that out. <clears throat> so you can see in this picture that it is in the winter time. There's frost on the uh, bushes and on the grass, and the water is not frozen. And so we actually had a uh, member memorandum of understanding with um, EPCOR to use their warm water from the plant and to use it for our fish farm. And of course, we would have to move our fish farm up to Lake Wobbleman. We were asking them, what would it cost us to take your hot water? And they said, free, because it's a waste. They don't want any water, but they do want the greenhouse gas credit. And that's not a problem because in using their hot water, they uh, to heat our greenhouses and our fish pond, we are now not using natural gas, and therefore we're not spewing up carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. So we were also looking at nuclear, which is not, of course, available uh, where we are, but nuclear power plants also have a lot of hot water. It's interesting that if you think about it, that electricity is generated with coal and nuclear because it is boiling water, it's steam that is turning the turbines. So we're still in the steam age, even though we're using nuclear and coal to generate that. So it's something to think about. So how much energy do we have on the planet Earth? This is 15 ter terawatts you know, um, per year um, that we consume. This is how much is available on the planet Earth in terms of natural gas, petroleum, uranium, and coal. So if you take 900 you know, as a unit, and we consume 15 of those units per year, um, that would give us 60 years of coal. Oh, we're saved. We don't have to think about because 60 years is a very long time. But of course, 60 years is really very short in the history of civilization. So what can we look at? Well, what about solar? Solar is infinite, at least <laughs> that we can think about. So why are we not using solar? So that's what I've been trying to do with my students and in my practice is to look at using solar energy. But I'm doing it in a way that, again, is look at synergy. So this is the uh, McKernan Community League, which is up in Edmonton, just south of the University of Alberta campus. And uh, I designed that with a, a roof, a metal roof. That metal roof is there because it has to shed water. But because I used a dark color metal roof, it absorbs solar heat. When the sun shines on that roof, it absorbs the heat. And what I did is I take that heat and I duck that, that heat into the building. A very simple concept. And the cost of that solar collector, if you want to call it solar collector, is free because I'm using the metal roof 
which I need to prevent rain from coming into the building, but it's doing two purposes. So again, I'm encouraging people with these examples to think about being synergetic, killing two birds with stone, okay, with one stone. And so why not look for such opportunities to do that? Um, so we duck the solar heat into the building and thermal mass is something that we need because there might be too much solar heat that it can overheat the building so you need to store it. So what we've done is that we duct the solar heat underneath the concrete floor slab in this community center and we get nice uh, radiant floor heating in the basement and the concrete floor slab stores the solar heat and releases solely into the building. So it's free. Again, the, the thermal storage is free because the concrete floor has to be there anyways. Another thing that we were looking at is how do we preheat the air that's coming into the building? And so what I came up with is putting a duct uh, underneath the, uh, um, uh, the landscape and ducting that from, uh, from about 100 feet into the building. And by the time you get, say, minus 30 degree air going into the building, rather than heating from minus 30 to coming up to plus 20, it goes through the ground and it would heat it, it would preheat it to perhaps maybe um, five degrees or zero degrees. So it's not warm enough to bring into the building. And so we do need a furnace to boost it up. But you're heating from uh, zero degrees to 20 degrees rather than minus 30 outdoor air to plus 20. And so you save a considerable amount of heat. It's not 100%, but it's substantially reducing the amount of uh, heating that you need for the building. The interesting thing about putting that heat uh, earth tube in the ground is that in the summertime when it's plus 30, by the time it comes into the building, it's taking the temperature of the earth. And the temperature of the earth in Alberta is about four degrees Celsius. And so it actually helps to air condition the building without putting in air conditioning. So again, what we're doing is not high tech. The things that I'm um, suggesting to you is looking for low tech advantages, understanding nature, understanding the environment, and take advantage of that for our building. So I've done a lot of these earth tubes for uh, single uh, family dwellings, for, for townhouses, for apartment buildings, for factories and so on. It's just a simple tube in the ground um, that, that moderates temperature uh, during the winter and moderates temperature in the summer. Very simple concept. So let's look at another thing as an example. If you're looking for a building to buy or building to design, there's a difference between a skylight and a clear story. The, the um, skylights are horizontal and, um, and that allows the summer sun to come through, but a clear story, which is a vertical uh, window on the roof, is vertical and it lets the low winter sun come in. And so really you should be looking for something like a clear story rather than a skylight. And so with that understanding, I was thinking of putting greenhouses in Alberta. And of course, greenhouses are flat. What about tilting the greenhouse towards the sun so that it just gets more of the low winter sun? Well, obviously um, it would be very expensive to tilt the whole greenhouse up. But even though we live in Alberta, the prairies is fairly flat, you can always find a south-facing slope. So what I've done is that I have designed greenhouses on the south-facing slope. So in essence, you can see that the greenhouse is tilted towards the low winter sun. And inside, we just terraced it from top to bottom. So it has a very good orientation for the winter sun, which is what you need. I've also added a deck in front of the greenhouse. And the reason for the deck, and rather than staining it to brown color, we painted it white. And the reason for that is that it reflects more sunlight into the space. So with that understanding, when I designed a aircraft hangar for the Calgary International Airport, I put a white roof on top 
on the lower portion of the office and the hangar with the solar collectors on the vertical wall. And you can see the white roof and we're installing the solar collectors. It, it increases the amount of solar gain by 30%, just because I used a white color roof rather than a dark color roof. That decision has no extra cost, but it decreases the amount of solar cost by 30%. So again, think about how to take advantage of nature. And again, the same thing that I did with the, um, the McKernan Community Center, I've ducted all the solar hot air underneath the, uh, the concrete slab, and you can't see it anymore when it's done um, because it's all buried. And um, the interesting um, thing about this was that the owner of the aircraft hangar allowed me to experiment with this, and but he didn't give me very much money, so we can only do one third of the aircraft hangar. The mechanics found out that one third is much more comfortable in the winter time, and so they always pull the aircraft towards that one third that has the radiant heating underneath. The other two thirds did not have the solar heat underneath, and so the owner of the aircraft hangar came back to me and said, you know, Tang, that was a great idea. Let's do it for the rest of it. And I had to tell him it's too late. It's too late because now to, to put the solar heat underneath the concrete floor slab, I would have to jackhammer up two thirds of the aircraft hangar floor. And it's about nine inch with reinforced concrete, which is very expensive because airplanes are very heavy and they need very strong slabs. So they had the opportunity to do the right thing when you're planning and designing the project. To try to retrofit later is not feasible. So you have to think about the future when you're designing uh, things for the future. And here, we did not even think about a roof. We just, although we do have a little bit of a roof here, um, but snow is a fantastic reflector of sunlight. It reflects 90% of the solar radiation incident on it. And so when the sun is shining, not only does it get direct solar radiation into the church, into the solar collector, by the way, these are solar collectors and these are windows. You can't tell the difference and many people don't even realize it's a solar heated building, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that the snow reflects the sunlight into the building, increasing about 30 more to 40% more solar gain, just because you're not shoveling the snow. <laughs> so obviously you don't want to put, uh, you don't want the snow to be on paths and, and entrances. But in other places we have landscaping, leave the snow on there and take advantage of the snow reflection of the snow. So this is where nature is actually working for us. We want more sunlight in the winter and the snow helps to reflect the sunlight into our building. So take advantage of that, <laughs> work with nature. So another I, uh, thing you need to think about when you're looking at a building is the shape of your building is gonna determine how much energy you're gonna consume. A single family dwelling, a single family house, a bungalow, a split level, a detached house, which when you have two units side by side, is more energy efficient because there's no heat loss from the party wall. And of course, if you live in townhouse or apartment building, there's even less heat loss. So really we have to think about the way we have been buying um, our houses. And the choice of our houses is gonna make a difference. Single family houses are wasteful, not only because of the amount of heat loss, but the wasteful land and resources. So they can have a side yard and a backyard and a, and a front yard. Well, we have to think about higher density, multiple dwellings. So it's going to be a change in our attitudes towards housing. But if you think about the future, how are you going to reduce your energy consumption? We're going to have to cluster together densification um, and the end of suburbia. So why am I talking to you about sustainability? Is it to save energy? Is it to save resources? Is it stop climate change? Really, what we're talking about is about human health. That really is primary. 
for what we need to do. Climate change have caused more forest fires. The rising sea levels have increased throughout the world. You can see storms and, um, and, and flooding has also been occurring all over the world, resulting in smoke, mold growth, property damage, high insurances, and, and of course, risk to human health. And so we have to look at how this pollution and climate change have affected and reduced our lifespan. COVID, as we know, is something I don't need to harp on anymore. We know that it is increasing. Hopefully the vaccine is just one of the arsenal that is going to help us um, address it. But there will be other emerging diseases and we're gonna need another, another vaccine. And we may need a dozen vaccinations in the future. So that's something I'm not really that keen on. So um, let's look at what we need to do with this pandemic. It has resulted in economic loss, unemployment, starvation, illness and death. We're all in it together. Is a pandemic a blessing, which is an interesting uh, uh, comment that I'm making. Well, it has curtailed travel, international travel, and therefore there's less pollution being produced by that. The, the air pollution has decreased. The amount of energy that we have is decreased because we're not uh, um, uh, uh, going to our, uh, our our workplace and commuting all, all the time. Is that a new normal? Okay, one of the problems with the pandemic, and I wanted to share this with you, is that it is it, 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 it spreads, not just by droplets, but also by minuscule amounts that float in the air and can go from one room to another room. You don't have, you know, even the two meter separation is insufficient. It's carrying all over the place. So what I'm doing right now in my retirement is to look at some technology that would help to uh, irradiate all the diseases so that it would not be transmitted. So what we just got a little grant from the Global Affairs Canada to, of all things, to look at a bus shelter, to clean the air in a bus shelter. It's rather ironic that we got a grant to clean the air in a bus shelter because the people waiting for the bus for maybe five minutes are more concerned than trying to address the pandemic that is making a lot more people sick. But that's, I cannot understand why that is, but we're taking advantage of this uh, opportunity to clean the air in the bus shelter with our new technology. And in doing so, we would be able to also uh, address the uh, pandemic. I'm not going to get too much into detail there um, because it's a lot more that I can talk about. But one of the things that we we're looking at is that we really are indebted to the frontline workers. But when they're putting on these masks, you can see that it's because they have perhaps 12 hour days because of their um, schedule and it's causing rashes and, 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 and uh, harm to them. So we're going to come up with a face shield that does not touch the face. And the only way we could do that is to blow clean air, disinfect the air, and we've done some 3D printing to come up with some of idea of which we can use our technology that we're designing for the bus shelter to, to miniaturize it, battery operate it, so that we can um, disinfect any type of germs, and including the COVID, from uh, from our front frontline workers, so that's what I'm currently working on right now, and we can also use that for construction workers to just blow the air down the face of the people, so they're not um, 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 breathing in drywall dust or anything like that. Okay, I'm going to have to wrap up fairly soon. Uh, one of the things that we were looking at is um, about the water pollution. We talked about air pollution, now let's talk about water pollution. The city of Fuzhou in China, and like many other countries, they throw their uh, effluent into the river. And what they did was that they just planted medicinal plants along that river. And just having the medicinal plants clean up the sewage by simple using nature to do that. So we took that idea 
and we work with the um, uh, John, Dr. John Todd at the New Conway Institute to see if we could clean up some of the rivers in China to, because that was one of our projects is to design a new uh, village in, in, uh, in, in China. And so we decided to take a bit of that water, go through our, uh, our, our development, and in doing so, we also considered that the village next door to our development needs to have some opportunities for uh, growing uh, fish. And so we clean the water from that dirty river, put it into the pond, and the villagers can clean the water, I have the clean water to grow fish. And so this is our concept. We won first prize at an international design competition, and we won the first prize in 2012. And I'm not bragging, but I wanted to say we won not because of our beautiful building design. If you look at our design, it's nothing out of the ordinary. It's fairly simple uh, design. It's not, you know, uh, uh, something that would win a design award, but the jury uh, realized that our idea of sustainability, community, and food production was what um, uh, they decided make our design the best of all the beautiful designs that they had from other countries. So synergy, again, is two or more things functioning together produce, to produce a result not independently obtainable. So what, a few more things. Landscaping design may look very beautiful, but it, it, it requires a lot of energy, fertilizer, herbicides, and so on to make it like this. It, is just not feasible. And yet we have all this lawn that looks like a carpet. I don't know why we want a carpet outside, but that's what our society wants. It requires a lot of maintenance. It requires a, a lot of water to, uh, to, to keep that looking like a carpet. We really need to have landscaping that is more natural and diverse uh, with species. So in closing, we need to look at nature, but sometimes nature is not the best. We're, these are for people that have lost their leg. We have tried to come up with some different designs, and eventually this is the design that works the best. Completely different than trying to just copy the shape of our legs. Think beyond the ordinary is what we're asking the people that are listening to this think about. Likewise, when we're looking at buildings, we had to illuminate our buildings and we went from um, sunlight to, uh, to candles, um, incandescence and compact fluorescence and then LED. But it's interesting that a lot of designers now thinking about and designing for daylighting. So we're returning back to the sun to help illuminate our buildings. So what do you need to do when you're designing buildings and designing anything? You need to look at creativity, integrity, and global thinking. With these three parameters, you can, uh, you can solve the rest. So um, design innovation is bringing all these things together in an integrated manner. Okay, so just some examples of creative designs. I'm not going to go through that too much. I'd just like to finish in saying we must learn the lessons from the past. And uh, we, have, we, we know the present, we know the past, and we can look at trends, and we can look at towards a sustainable future. So thank you very much. I'm glad to have this opportunity to share a little bit of my ideas with you. I do apologize for the beginning that I did not understand how to um, to put the screen on for you. Thank you so much, Tang. That's just wonderful. You've uh, really given us so much to think about, and I'm seeing some of the some of the comments and the questions come in on on the chat. Um, but just before we start looking at those, I just especially love uh, how you're always encouraging us to think beyond the ordinary, to think creatively. 
and and to learn from the past while we're working in the present and looking to the future. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn now to a few of the questions that we have here. And um, and then I'll, I'll ask them to you, Tang, and, and if, if you're able to just maybe uh, share some of your thoughts about these questions and comments. The first that I'm seeing here, Tang, um, is a question that is, what are the ways to attract people to more environmentally sustainable buildings and housing? Uh, and housing. So making them aesthetically appealing, adding shared amenities, what works? Well, it's interesting that, <laughs> Joan, you and I are in the design profession and so aesthetics is really important. Aesthetics does give us a uplifting of our spirits uh, when we see something that are beautiful. Um, so that certainly is important. But things like aesthetics is like an airplane. A plane airplane is really just very technical, very mathematical, very, and, and yet it is very aesthetical piecing. So you can look at technology and you can look at the aesthetics and it can come one into the other. So the choices that we make is very, very important. So where do you want to live? Obviously, we should be thinking about living in a place where we reduce our wasted time commuting. And so you might want to consider maybe living downtown in a high rise apartment and so that you can walk to work and get some exercise. So those are the choices that we have. Likewise, the choice that we have in terms of uh, the food, what we buy and how we um, conduct ourselves and the other things that we, we buy from the uh, from clothing to uh, to technology and so forth. Tang, this is a little bit related, I think. Um, this, this person starts out by saying, great presentation, uh, and says, can you please, Tang, say something about if there are some clean tech companies or projects that you're particularly excited about? Um, this person's curious about what innovations you see uh, from a built environment perspective. So things that are particularly exciting to you at this point that might just occur. I'm actually very encouraged uh, by that question because even though I've given you some very, very nasty examples of what our, our trends are, are happening in terms of uh, energy and pollution and so forth, is that there's a lot of really, really clever people out there that are having designing some very clever clean technologies, uh, food uh, that is not just organic, but that is you know, easy to 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 produce. Um, and we should be looking at and um, and catering to them to 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 be a supporter of those technologies. So I don't have any particular one in mind at the moment, and I'd rather not be um, uh, saying that because there's just so many out there. So it's a matter of just finding them and, and then being a patron to, to those to encourage them to continue that way. But I am encouraged that, that this generation knows what's coming down the line and they need to be the ones to save the world because we have screwed it up this last generation. Thank you. And I have to say that of all the, the, the comments and, and uh, questions I'm getting, I'm getting just as many, if not more, uh, comments that are just, just thank you, awesome lecture, so inspiring, and that sort of thing. But let me go to something that's a little bit uh, more concrete, asking you something again. Um, here's one for us. Do you think sustainability solutions or integrations are currently taught well or at all in architecture or design schools? <laughs> that's that's a really good question because I just retired from teaching architecture for you know, a very very long time. Uh, the the newer professors that are coming online uh, have this mindset that they are not looking at just doing one thing, uh, but incorporating other issues like sustainability is a term that was not really thrown around very much even like 20 years ago but it is incorporated into all kinds of courses not just design courses but in in politics in in in, uh, in, in law and so forth and that is very encouraging that they have these that, that this becomes a norm 
And it's not something that are just the purview of uh, tree huggers. And so we're all in this together. And, and I would say the, the, uh, the, the newer, uh, younger teachers that are coming online have this mindset because they know that they have the responsibility to teach the next generation to become even more sustainable. Thank you. I'm wondering about this one, Tang. Um, this is specific to your uh, your admonition about housing and, and, and tendencies in housing. Um, and the question is, is spreading of disease a concern with the densification of housing? Uh, okay. Yes, when you cluster people together, there are more opportunities for transmission. And that is why we need to look at how we uh, uh, ventilate our buildings. And it's not just opening up the windows, you know, because we can't do that in the middle of the winter time if we insist on living in Canada. Um, and so we have to look at how the air is, is being, uh, I would say, flesh out, if I could use that term, through each room. And of course, the air that's coming into the room cannot just merely be recirculated from another room, which may have somebody that's ill, it could be pollution because there's some printers nearby or whatever, or cooking odors. And so we need to look at air purification. That is something that the World Health Organization finally realized that the uh, COVID is being transmitted, not just by droplets, but being uh, transmitted through the air. And so we need to look at the air, and it's not just simply filtration, because the filters that we have in our furnaces is strictly to filter out some dust particles because they don't want to gum up the fan of the furnace. The filters in your furnace is not to clean the air so that you breathe in uh, cleaner, uh, less dust. It is to basically to protect the motor of the furnace. So we need to look at how the furnace is distributing the air. We need to do three things. The dust has to be uh, filtered out. The, uh, the volatile organic compounds like formaldehyde also needs to be uh, eliminated. And of course, it has to have irradiation of any microbes that are passing through. So it kills it before it comes into the room. So we need to look at air filtration and that's exactly what I'm working on, but there's lots, many, many other people that are looking at um, uh, filtering the air. So we need to have, and, and the interesting thing about the pandemic, if I could add this, is that we have become more conscious of being hygienic. And so we're washing our hands, which we perhaps did not do as much in the future. We are doing that, we're cleaning up the house. We're having not just body hygiene, but we're also looking at house hygiene. And so if by doing so, we are, of course, making it a more healthy environment for us. I'm seeing many more questions. We'll just we'll get to a few. I'm seeing this one, uh, Tang, that I know that you have thought about so much and, and you together with students. So I'll ask this one next. Um, First, thank you so much. Uh, this person says, I'm curious to know how you think we can integrate not only more sustainable design into our communities, but some of the ways or some examples of the marriage of sustainable and accessible design for those with disabilities that are often forgotten when we discuss sustainable design, not only in architecture, but in infrastructure as well. Thanks again for this presentation. Oh, well, uh, accessibility is very dear to my heart because I've been uh, on the uh, on the uh, accessibility um, uh, council of the Safety Codes Council, and I've been working with people that have uh, visual uh, uh, disabilities and mobile disabilities, and uh, th those are part of our society. It's and, and I would like to sort of preface that by saying that we need diversity in our society. And so diversity are people that have, you know, different abilities. You know, some play piano very well and some are good at sports. But likewise, we need diversity in terms of, um, of everybody else, in terms of physical abilities as well too. 
some people like myself and you, Joe, we have we have a disability. We have to wear glasses <laughs> because we don't see very well without glasses. But it would be sad if society said, oh, you have a disability, you wear glasses, you should not exist. Now that's of course very uh, dramatic of what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that we need to cherish the people that have this diversity in our population, just like we need plant diversities, we need people diversities. And so in terms of accommodation, there are all kinds of, of, of uh, guidelines and it's in the building code. And so those are there. And of course, a lot still needs to be done to, 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 uh, to make it better, but they are uh, part of our design uh, process. And if you don't include uh, accessibility in our design, you cannot get a building permit. And so government did step in and I'm glad, but it took a long time for them to understand that. And so, so the next thing is looking at accessibility, not just in the building, but outside. And that's the next phase that we need to address. And there are some things that are being addressed. Other countries have done that really well in terms of um, um, things like uh, at, at, at uh, uh, street uh, corners and intersections where you, it's not just the red light and green light, but there's a sound that comes through. And you probably experienced some of that here. Um, so there, it's, it's emerging uh, and accessibility has to be and, and should be a cherished part of our society. Tang, I think that's a, a very good spot um, to, to end because we need to end. Um, that is on the note of um, just underlining that we need diversity uh, and that we're enriched by our diversity and that that can't be separated from sustainability. I want to just take the opportunity to thank you once more so much and also to say that Tang, uh, you will join us. So I'll see you at 2.30 again. Uh, thank you so much. And my class will, will uh, jump into that uh, virtual uh, space at that point. So uh, thank you once again. We'll, I'll hand it over to Alison McIntosh at this point, just to wrap things up.